Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Graham Stewart, and I am the moderator uh, for this virtual town hall. Uh, welcome to everyone joining us, uh, either through the Zoom webinar or watching on uh, the webcast. Uh, I'm gonna get out of your way here pretty quickly, but uh, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Thanks to everyone who uh, submitted a question in advance. Uh, we'll be asking these questions throughout uh, the session. Um, you won't be surprised to know that there was a fair amount of overlap. So where uh, questions are about the same thing, we've sort of bundled them up uh, into omnibus questions and will give us a chance to get through things uh, a bit faster. Uh, during the, uh, the live part of this session, we'll only be taking uh, questions through the email address, conversations at yorku.ca. Uh, that will be on the, the Conversations website for your reference as well. So that's conversations at yorku.ca. Uh, uh, and uh, we're anticipating that there will probably be more questions than we have time uh, to answer uh, in this hour. So anything that we do not get to uh, over the next 60 minutes, uh, we're going to uh, take back, collate, and then forward to the appropriate uh, people or departments within the universities to, uh, to get an answer. So if you have submitted a question or if you do submit a question, uh, during the town hall and you don't receive an answer uh, during the live session, we will get an answer to you uh, as soon as we can. Uh, so that's enough from uh, me and I would like to introduce uh, President uh, Rhonda Lenton for some opening remarks. Good afternoon, everyone. Bonjour, bonjour. I want to first of all, just thank everyone for joining us. We really wanted to hold this virtual town hall because we appreciate that everyone right now probably has many questions. And we think it's exceptionally important that we're finding ways to come together, even if we can't do that face to face, so that we have an opportunity to answer some of your questions and that we can share some of the plans that we're thinking about and working on. I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, this meeting is virtual and because of that, we're not all actually gathered in the same space. Uh, York's a land acknowledgement might not be the territory that you're currently on. So I would ask that if that is the case, that you each take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory that you are on and the current treaty holders. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Huron-Wendat. It's now home to many First Nation, Inuit and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, and that's an agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. I wanna to try to keep my comments brief today to maximize the opportunity that you have to ask us questions. I would though like each of the members of my team to briefly introduce themselves because I want everyone to be available to answer questions around matters that pertain to their core responsibilities. So maybe I could just start with Lisa. Hi everyone, I'm Lisa Phillips. I'm the Provost and Vice President Academic. Carol. I'm Carol McCauley, Vice President Finance and Administration. Rhee. I'm Rhee Wong, Interim Vice President Research and Innovation. Sheila. Hi, I'm Sheila Kote Meek. I'm the uh, Vice President, Equity, People, and Culture. And Jeff. Hello, everybody. I'm Jeff O'Hagan, Vice President, Advancement. And please feel free to ask questions of any of us. Um, I want to start off my remarks today with just a very warm thank you to the entire community. Over the past few weeks, I have been incredibly moved by what I've seen as a generosity of spirit and creativity on the part of all members of the community in coming together to respond to this pandemic. I want to thank all the hardworking staff who have transitioned to their homes in supporting and providing the services that keep us running, but also a very special thank you to those staff who have continued to attend to our Glendon and Keele campuses to provide essential services. 
I want to thank our faculty members, full-time contract, as well as our TAs, who have undertaken the enormous amount of work to transition, to complete the winter and, and to be thinking about summer from face-to-face -face course delivery to online and other remote learning um, strategies to ensure that our students are able to continue to progress in their studies. I also wanna thank our students. You have shown incredible patience and resilience in working with us as we sort uh, out the many ways in which we can provide mechanisms through which um, you can complete your programming. And you've participated in that. And we're very excited um, to continue to work with you to see those of you who are ready to graduate and as, as well to support those of you who are still progressing. And a thank you as well to our alumni, donors and community members with whom we continue to work and who continue to support the efforts of this university. I wanna move secondly, just to talk a little bit about um, the work and the accomplishments that York University have, have done all these past uh, number of weeks and the willingness to continue to do that work. No matter what front we think about, whether or not it's teaching and learning or research, community engagement, there have been just incredible leadership that has been, has been demonstrated by York that really aligns with the values that we have as an institution, our commitment to being a community engaged university, committed to social justice and excellence um, and being progressive. Um, I, I won't have time here to give you all of the examples, but obviously the creativity in how you transition to remote learning the um, hubs that have been uh, created, virtual labs, simulations, to help with the complex aspect of what do you do about hands-on learning. The libraries have been partnering with publishers and other libraries to figure out ways in which we can continue to provide access to materials online. Um, we're going to have a very robust uh, course offerings this summer, and that's due to the efforts uh, of our colleagues, our faculty members. Uh, some just innovation that we had in supporting our students, the laptop program that we rolled out to make sure that staff, students, faculty had the technology that they needed in order to be able to continue to access their learning and to teach their courses. The supports that have been provided to students in residences who were not able to return home uh, to make sure that um, they had the support that they needed. In terms of while we're doing all of this on the teaching and learning front, colleagues continue to advance their research, not just not limited to um, fighting COVID-19, although I have to say that we have faculty from across the university who have been engaged in specific research targeted to this pandemic, but in general, the research that it has, uh, is continuing to ensure that York um, contributes not only to this pandemic, but to other global threats that we face. Um, faculty have developed very novel tools such as Shulix COVID-19 predictive dashboard. It's being used not only by us, but which we're sharing with governments and other universities. I wanna say that we also continue to really demonstrate leadership as we always have in matters on the social side, as well as the, the STEM side and thinking about the policy implications, um, connecting experts, connecting community organizations so that we could actually work together in uh, advancing and, and um, addressing this pandemic. Uh, on the community engagement side, and I'll, I'll just close with this, um, there's been enormous uh, willingness and interest on the part of the entire community on can we volunteer? Can we contribute to support our students? Um, we have protective equipment. Can we give some of that equipment to our hospitals who are in dire need of different kinds of um, uh, resources? So this is just a few of the examples of the ways in which York University has continued to demonstrate the importance of York as an anchor institution in our communities. So based on all of this and much more, um, I'm confident that we will it won't be easy, but we will come through this challenging time together. We will be stronger, not only as an institution, but we are going to continue to make important contributions to the City of Toronto, the GTA, the province, and the country. So I want to turn to your questions now, but just before turning to your questions, I do want to start off by acknowledging that we do not have all the answers at this time. 
We necessarily took each term at one, at one um, first focusing on the winter term to get that completed, then turned our attention to the important work of ensuring that we could have a robust summer term. But we are now, in addition, turning our attention to scenario planning for the fall. And I say scenario planning because we do not yet know whether or not we'll be able to come back face to face in September. So it will be important for us to anticipate what the needs will be, the risks for the institution, the plans that we'll have to have in place, depending on whether or not face to face in September is going to be possible or whether or not this will continue further on. I want you to know that the principles that are guiding that planning and all of our decision making is the first and foremost, the safety and the well-being of our entire community, fairness to students, academic integrity, timely decision making, and trying to take actions that will mitigate to the extent possible the risks to our community, our university, and our partners. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to you and we'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, President Linton. Um, so the, the first question and, and sort of the number one thing that we received in the, the pre-submitted questions was uh, really along the lines of your last point, how long is this going to last and, and what plans are being made for the fall? Um, so to maybe to drill down into that a little bit, I wonder if uh, the team can address uh, you know, how we'll be supporting uh, expanded sort of online delivery going forward, uh, you know, what implications there might be for tuition fees in, in that, and, um, you know, when we are able to return to normal campus operations, how will staff and students and faculty be reintegrated? So let me just um, offer first a little bit of framework for that, and then I'm going to turn it over mm -hmm. to the provost if she could elaborate on, on detailed plans. Um, I do want to say that right now there's a great deal of modeling that is being done on the likelihood of achieving a flat curve um, in Ontario and in Canada and what that would mean for the timeline that we might be facing and decisions that the government might face in terms of the social isolation and other restrictions that we're facing. Uh, uh, the, the estimates are, and we're getting guidance on this, of course, from our own academics, our own emergency operations group. We've been guided, fortunately, by an incredible team with a great deal of expertise, including staff and faculty members on being able to take a look at the likely um, scenarios. But we're also working with the Council of Ontario Universities and Universities Canada, so that we're working together. One of our own faculty members, Dr. Wu from Science, um, has in fact joined a federal team on, on modeling this out. Uh, I think that people are predicting a surge over the next two to four weeks in terms of the frequency of cases uh, that we're going to experience and that people are in general talking about July as a time when we might start to see potentially some uh, le uh, re reduction in um, some of these strategies that the government um, has imposed. And again, I really want to emphasize that this is all being modeled right now. Each of you probably know as much as we know and we hear, but we're more than happy to share with you um, as we get further information. But this is why I say that it's so important to do scenario planning. So what does the university look like if it's only summer that we have online? What does it look like if we're not able to come back with face-to-face -face instruction, uh, you know, for, for that matter, for athletics, for events on campus um, uh, into the fall? So I'm going to turn it over to the provost who might uh, be able to provide some details about the supports that we're offering. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, happy to elaborate. Um, we, of course, are very focused right now on mounting a strong summer program. Our enrollments for the summer are quite strong. And there's a lot of interest in studying over the summer, uh, perhaps in some areas more because uh, people may find that they're at home and they are anticipating having less uh, to do that they were hoping to do over the summer and maybe would like to advance their learning a bit more quickly. So we are admitting students um, as normal, both domestic students, international students. Um, we recognize that some have additional financial barriers to study. Um, that's absolutely going to be a factor that we worry about with students, both incoming and continuing students. Um, many of you have heard about the emergency bursaries that we have established, and we encourage all students who have 
immediate financial needs um, that have been uh, aggravated by the situation with uh, COVID to please you know, come and, and check those out. Um, we're here to help. Um, we have also been talking to the provincial government about how it might think about supporting students to continue their studies or to start their studies in the fall despite um, disrupted summer jobs or other financial challenges. And they have indicated that that's all um, something that is on the table for consideration, um, that they want people to be able to continue with post-secondary. They want uh, high school students to be able to finish and, um, and be able to apply. Um, we, we know that um, in terms of the fall, uh, although we're very focused on summer right now, I, I do know people are already turning their minds to what would it look like if we can't come back in person in September. And it's not time to make that decision yet. We're still hopeful that we could have some positive developments um, that would allow us to plan an in-person fall. Uh, however, we also know that people need some lead time for planning. So there will come a time at some point, uh, you know, probably midsummer, where we will need to let students know how we're going to approach the fall. Uh, so we've got our eye closely on that and um, a lot of excellent, very um, creative and nimble work is happening in the faculties to ensure that we have um, offerings ready for students, whatever the circumstances may be. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, staying with uh, sort of these omnibus uh, questions that are bundled up from uh, multiple questions received from the communities, uh, we've had quite a few people asking uh, how will students in nursing and other programs uh, with required clinical or placement hours uh, make up their program uh, requirements under these new conditions? So I want to start off by saying that programs such as nursing that have these required hands-on components um, are really showing incredible creativity and just really thinking differently about how it's possible to provide though that hands-on learning and the student learning outcomes that are associated with that type of um, experiential learning in different ways, such as virtual labs, simulations, just for example. This is obviously you know, more complex than some of um, the move to put uh, content uh, in online. And I think that all of us together are realizing the uh, creativity that is involved in creating high quality uh, online and other remote learning strategies, but we're really seeing those units uh, come together and share across the system for different alternate ways in which that uh, learning component can be completed. I don't know if the provost wants to add anything. Yes, um, it's really been quite remarkable to see what our colleagues are coming up with. Um, these are some of the most difficult things, of course, uh, to replace with a uh, virtual experience or a remote experience. Uh, field experiences, studio work, lab work, uh, practicums, placements. Um, you know, these are often required for accredited programs uh, and very important to achieving the learning outcomes. Uh, so they, they certainly are going to have to take place. So many um, strategies are being pursued in terms of virtual labs that can be done that actually can provide students with at least some of the hands-on application that they require to complete their program. Uh, in some cases, programs are reordering material. So they may be providing a course this summer, for instance, which is required, but is more easy to take online in order to make space later in the program so that when we are able to come back, students can make up the time in the lab or the studio or with a placement. Um, we, we know that some students are going to have to um, do uh, some of those requirements at a later time in their program than was perhaps planned. So no matter uh, how um, imaginative we are, there's going to be some situations that have to wait until we're back into in-person instruction. Uh, and we will accommodate that and problem solve with those students uh, to make sure that they can finish their program requirements. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just wanna remind everyone who's uh, on the webinar and on uh, watching on YouTube that if you would like to ask a question, you need to use the email address, conversations at yorku.ca. Uh, that's the best way to get uh, your question in front of us. And on that note, we'll go to one, a question from uh, the email. 
Uh, this is from a uh, housing health and safety representative. Uh, undergraduate residents employees who are still required to come to work Monday to Friday uh, are still required to come to work Monday to Friday, while counterparts in other areas uh, who perform the same work come in once or twice a week. Um, and they're asking uh, whether it would be possible if their uh, department should consider allowing us to work, say, three days a week and giving us a few days to stay home and not be penalized uh, since most residences are not in full capacity. Um, I think I'm going to put that over to the Vice President of Finance and Administration, Carol McCauley. Sure. Thanks very much, Rhonda. Um, I think all options that work options um, remote and on campus are on the table and, and available for um, us to discuss with supervisors in the areas. You know, of course, the, the, our, our interest is in the well-being, um, not only of the students who are still in residence and need to have supports available to them, but also food services available to, to them and other things like that, but also the well-being of our staff. Um, so I know that, that many of our leaders are looking at uh, alternative uh, work arrangements that will allow people to, to be well, um, but also to continue to support our students. So that's a, that's a very specific suggestion and I can certainly discuss it with our leaders in that area. And one other thing, thank you so much for that, Carol. Um, just to everyone, because sometimes there's this notion that people who are at home um, aren't working that kind of Monday to Friday, um, same expectation. And I, I really want to emphasize that whether or not you're working from home or you're working um, on campus, that you're you know, people are still in touch, there's still a structure to the work, and, and we could really not be managing to maintain the operations of the university in the way that we are the supports for the transition and learning, the research support, managing our campuses without the full engagement of our colleagues, whether or not they are doing that work from home or, or they're doing it um, on campus. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll go to another question that we've received uh, over email, uh, conversations at yorku.ca. Um, and this is a question that we also received uh, pre-submitted ahead of time, uh, which is what is York doing to ensure appropriate privacy and security criteria is incorporated into the selection of video conferencing technology for classes and university business? Zoom has a long list of known privacy and security issues. Privacy issues associated with Zoom include provision of user data, data to third parties like Facebook. So any of my colleagues can um, feel free to comment I think what I'm going to say about this is there's no doubt that this is very new terrain for all of us and the speed with which we've had to design alternative ways of holding meetings, of holding classes, um, working together with colleagues, tenure and promotion committee meetings, whatever, you know, whatever it happens to be, um, this is all quite new. And we've turned to the technology that we have available, which includes not just Zoom, but you know, colleagues are using Moodle, they're using many different platforms. And as problems are raised or our concerns are brought forward, we'll certainly uh, make efforts to try to address those concerns. And as we go, um, now as we're approaching summer, we'll continue to pick up new technologies. This is an area where the entire system in Ontario and to some extent even Universities Canada, where there's a lot of good collaboration. People are talking to each other about what technology is working, what's not working. That's also true for online exams, figuring out what the best platform is for really managing that well. Um, and we are learning as we go and improvements will occur as we go along. I don't know if any of my colleagues want to add anything to that. You could put your hand up so I could see you. Lisa? You're on mute, Lisa. Ah. Sorry. Uh, I will just add that um, we have been looking closely at some of the underlying um, legal um, features of some of these tools and uh, correcting them where we can. We're very concerned with protecting uh, students' personal information, their privacy rights. We have an institutional policy on this and we're doing, uh, being quite watchful, um, looking closely at the terms upon which various providers of uh, solutions and platforms are 
providing those services to us. We have withdrawn from some contracts, uh, looked for other providers that are more uh, better at meeting those requirements that we have. I believe that Zoom has done some of its own work to address the concern about Facebook. Um, York University has disabled one of the functions in Zoom, which is called attention monitoring, um, which allows uh, the meeting host to sort of uh, surveil what people in the meeting are doing, whether they're paying attention or looking at their email. And we've disabled that. So that's no longer a feature of the York Zoom um, platform. Uh, there is fairly minimal information that um, you have to provide to participate in a Zoom meeting. Your email address is about all for hosts it's slightly more but um you know i think we're all learning that uh we're getting quickly quite dependent on this platform in many ways it's got a lot of advantages to it because uh, we can add quite a lot of people and we can integrate it with moodle it has some really very valuable features right now but we are also um, exploring other ways to achieve these goals so that we um, are not you know overly bound to any one platform if people have concerns about it. So there have been some concerns that students have had about do they have to have their camera on when they're taking an online class? And the answer is no, you're not obliged to show your face or your home or your space uh, while you're participating in an online lecture with, uh, with Zoom, for instance. So I hope that might answer a couple of the specific dimensions of that question. Thank you very much. Uh, now we received quite a few questions uh, pre-submitted um, from graduate students uh, who were wondering um, about whether automatic program extensions uh, would be made available uh, and if some action would be taken uh, on uh, their tuition fees in addition to, you know, what other sort of supports and uh, assistance is being contemplated for graduate students at this time. Um, does, does the provost want to start with that question? Sure. I think there's some fairly widely known information, but just in case anyone is not aware, there is uh, an emergency bursary that the Faculty of Graduate Studies has established, which has been um, boosted in terms of its funding and which is available to any graduate student who's encountering um, exceptional financial difficulties right now. Um, we also have, I have some good news in the sense that we've been able to really look hard at our uh, deadlines for submitting work, uh, for completing thesis defenses, um, MR, major research paper evaluations, etc. And we will be extending by 30 additional days um, the ability to complete that work uh, without paying any additional fees. So we're hoping that will give some breathing room and some, um, some flexibility to students. Um, we will be looking very closely at the summer and uh, whether students were doing, of course, everything we can to make it possible for students to complete in the summer to progress their work in the ways they need to. Um, we're gonna be asking students to work with their supervisors around potentially reordering some of the components of their program or re-envisioning how they could be completed. But we do know there will be some cases where there were research activities, for instance, planned for this summer that will have to wait until a time when the student can travel or can visit certain labs or locations or studios. And so we will be working with individual students to ensure that where the program cannot deliver what it needs to for your studies, um, that we will be looking at ways to support you through some kind of extension where necessary. But we really encourage um, uh, graduate students to um, to really look at with their supervisors and their program directors, what can they get done this summer um, to keep moving through the program? And then where it's not possible, what are the options for reordering um, your studies to make sure you can, can get done? And, and we will be there to support you through that. And I, Jeff, I wonder if you'd also like to, to talk a little bit about the additional fund that we're setting up in anticipation that there might be greater uh, needs on the part of our students than we're currently set up to support. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Rhonda. I'm happy to, to mention that. And, and we, we've had a, a great outpouring of support from, from some of our alumni, our donors, and, and importantly, from our, our own community. Um, the, there's actually a group of, of leaders within uh, the faculty, uh, some of our colleagues who have stepped forward to try to initiate um, a, a, a way for people to support those emergency bursaries that, that were mentioned. 
uh, and very shortly you will see message, a message from them uh, about this uh, a new COVID-19 relief fund that donors can contribute to uh, to provide additional funding um, uh, so that we could support more students, both undergraduate and graduate, uh, domestic and international for these short-term needs uh, as well as uh, longer-term needs as well. So you'll see um, more information about that very shortly um, from, from these colleagues who, who've taken a great leadership uh, role in, in, in doing that. I see that Ree wants to make a comment as well. The support to the graduate student and as well as undergraduate student during the summertime to continue their research has been confirmed by tri council policy. They allow our research to continue using the grant funding to stations and June or October convocations. They express that they have worked hard to finish their degrees. Some say that they are the first in their family who had achieved this academic success. They say, uh, they say they always dreamt that their families would be present in the convocation and share the joy with them. They're also aware of the seriousness of COVID-19. They're just suggesting maybe please postpone the convocations instead of canceling them. So we have in effect um, come up with what I would refer to as sort of, I hope the best of both worlds in that um, we are in, in a sense postponing because we are going to invite all students who otherwise would have graduated in June if they would like to join the October uh, convocation. And if you think about this likely scenario, it would be very unlikely that we would actually be able to bring large groups of people together in any event before October. Um, so we're gonna expand that convocation and hopefully give all students who are able to stay or to return uh, to attend in October. But we also recognize that some students won't be able to return and they need and we need to have some type of marking of this important milestone in the lives of our students. And we did not want to just rely on the October. So we're also working on a virtual convocation in June for those students who are unable to come in October and trying to make that meaningful. So what could we do? Um, what kind of creative things could we do that families that may be in social isolation together um, might have certain I'm not sure how much I should give away because we're trying to make a little bit of this a, a surprise, but how could we help facilitate their ability to celebrate in their living rooms and in, in whatever spaces they have available um, and still run some of the core uh, addresses that normally happen at convocation. So remarks from the chancellor, remarks from the president, um, potentially one of our on docs that was to get their honorary degree um, providing uh, um, a speech as well. So we're working on both of those different options to give our students the maximum choice that they have to celebrate in the ways that will still be meaningful for them. I don't know if you want to add anything, Jeff or Lisa. I think uh, I think President Linton, you covered you covered the the bases and and really the message is. We, we don't want to let this moment go by. Uh, we do want to be able to celebrate as best we can, even if we are still uh, social distancing at that time. Uh, but then be sure that, that students know that they, are, that they are all invited to join us um, in the fall cycle for convocation ceremonies as well. Lisa? Yes, I, I just wanted to make sure that we draw the distinction between uh, completing your degree and graduating with your degree versus the convocation ceremony, which is also extremely important. But anyone who completes their program requirements, uh, when you do, you will be able to get your degree, regardless of which convocation form you choose to participate in or are able to participate in, you will get your degree. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, hey, thanks very much. Uh, so we have a question from a course director, uh, which is what is being uh, done to continue to engage employees during these times? Specifically, in what ways are our senior leaders working to ensure employees feel safe, secure, and engaged in their work? You know, this is it become um, very evident to us that we enjoy 
the fact that so many of our colleagues are engaged uh, in their work. And that includes both staff and faculty and that they're driven in that enthusiasm and that, in that engagement by their own concerns for their students, for the faculty, for our campuses, whatever their area of contribution has to be or, or is rather. Um, having said that though, we also understand that we've got a role in making sure that we are protecting the health and well-being of all of our employees that we're uh, talking to all groups of employees to ask what additional resources and supports do you need. I think it's very important that all of our normal services on campus uh, pertaining to health and well being have continued to run virtually, and we've provided a number of resources in case there are uh, colleagues, employees who are feeling. Uh, isolated um, or, or feeling that they're challenged in this working in this environment. We will also be continuing to expand additional resources to support, for example, online, other types of remote learning, um, how to conduct research in this environment, what are the challenges with, uh, with doing that? Um, you know, are there challenges with sabbaticals that need to be, do we need to have some flexibility and how um, sabbaticals are, are functioning? So we're really thinking about all the different core activities of the university and talking to employees about what kinds of supports they need um, to have. But, but again, I'm incredibly grateful um, and I've really been moved by the level of commitment and creative thinking and engagement that we have seen over these last numbers of weeks on the part of our employees. Lisa? Um, thank you very much, Rhonda, for mentioning the um, supports for instructors that are gonna be rolled out who are preparing for summer, to do summer in quite a different way. And I wanted to just uh, let you know that the Teaching Commons probably tomorrow will be rolling out a new website called Going Remote. And it's all about um, providing uh, design tips, um, introductory and more advanced, uh, you know, uh, tutorials and guides for how to instruct remotely, evaluation options, uh, answering intellectual property concerns that we've been hearing from instructors. Um, as well as uh, being able to connect you with either a staff or a faculty member who is interested in interacting and mentoring um, in uh, supporting these efforts. And one of the things I've been so struck by is how generous everyone has been about supporting each other um, and figuring out ways to support each other's work and uh, help those who might be feeling that this is a bit of a big ask to do uh, work from home or to teach remotely. So. Um, it's been a great community moment in a way, even though we're all really missing, I think I certainly am being physically present on campus and being able to be together with people. I want to just take the moment to give a real shout out to the colleagues in the teaching commons who have been doing just amazing work to really um, boost the resources and the knowledge sharing and the connecting of people so that we can maintain, you know, our core academic uh, mission. So thank you. I've got Sheila and then Carol. You're on mute. Um, oh. There you go. Go ahead. You're good. Yeah, I thought it was. Um, yeah, I just wanted to also uh, say that um, I'm actually quite impressed with uh, all employee groups uh, at the university and how they've uh, moved to this kind of new, uh, hopefully temporary uh, way of working. But um, in terms of supporting employees, uh, we've developed work from home guidelines that are being updated. There's a, a lot of resources that are available on the website um, to assist employees. But I think also what has been really important that I've noticed is that um, managers and supervisors are reaching out to um, individual members of their teams um, and, and really working hard to stay connected, whether it's through Zoom or through the telephone. And I think that those are really uh, important connectors. Um, you know, like even with my own team, I try to connect in, in with them uh, two or three times a week uh, and just, you know, just to say hello. Uh, we have uh, wellness 
check-ins uh, to make sure that everybody's staying safe and staying well. And I think people generally are coming together and feeling uh, quite supported. But I'm really, um, if there are other ideas that employees uh, require in terms of doing their work at home, I'm happy to hear them. And Carol, thank you, Sheila. Carol? Thanks. I just want to talk a little bit about the um, the division of finance and administration. <clears throat> the, this uh, this example of a town hall is one that we'll be following for the for our division. I think it's our, on April sixteenth. We'll be having a, a full divisional town hall, and I really look forward to uh, people participating, being able to see their faces. I've been uh, certainly very impressed with the number of meetings that continue, um, and how used to uh, we all are getting to to meeting in this forum. Um, we're getting to see something about each other, about how we live, and we get the odd cat or dog walk by or a child run into the room, and that's actually quite a way of staying engaged. And I find that even teams are starting to be able to, to joke and have bring some levity back into their relationships, which is really, uh, really terrific. So I, I want to give a particular um, acknowledgement, um, as I, I, I noticed at a, a, reg, a recent team meeting of, uh, of UIT. Um, their ability to support us getting to all of these online ways of working, um, getting new listservs available to us, getting Zoom um, more licenses, and and in such a fast time, I, I just uh, I, I've been just absolutely in awe of the work that they've done on getting us more connected. So thank you very much uh, to them as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we received quite a few questions, uh, which all sort of dealt with how uh, the uh, disruption is going to affect uh, staff and faculty uh, in terms of, of compensation, and so that could uh, and contracts. So that could uh, range from sort of the cancellation of contract uh, extensions, uh, changes to salary, uh, and potentially even layoffs. Uh, people have identified as as concerns. So I, I'm hoping uh, the panel can. Uh, address, uh, you know, what, what we might be looking at, at in that area. Look, I can very much understand why that is a concern. Uh, you know, one of the principles that I said that we were utilizing in terms of our own scenario planning was the health and well-being of our community, but also doing everything we could to mitigate um, the risks uh, you know, for our community members and, and for our university. Um, it is challenging without knowing uh, what the next several months are going to uh, look like. We have been uh, had with, with HR and under the leadership of uh, VP Equity, People and Culture, trying to think about what are the creative ways that we could address some of the perhaps uh, lack of alignment between work that needs to be done and some staff who were, it's very difficult to do their work from home. So we're looking, for example, to really sit down with the unions as we go along and as we start to, um, you know, face some of the challenges that, we, we, that might occur over the next number of uh, weeks, maybe even months. Um, could we talk, for example, about giving professional development opportunities for staff who are not able to do their work from home, but redeploying them in another area short term where there's high need. And those are obviously creative strategies that you only undertake in very um, exceptional circumstances. But those are just some of the ideas um, that were thinking about that we would like to discuss uh, with our unions, because it not only is a way to sort of solve, at least partially, the potential gap in work that needs to be done and, and workers who are struggling to do that work from home, but it could be actually an opportunity to let staff uh, find out and learn more about some other areas that they might be interested in uh, learning about. There's even potentially some lessons there about how skills, fundamental skills, transfer from one type of job um, to the other. Uh, you may be aware, and we do post all of our HR updates that we have recently um, extended uh, contracts for um, employees who are on an hour pay on an hourly basis. Um, we're also paying close attention to what the government is doing um, for people who are facing fewer hours, for example, and are there ways for the university to bridge 
um, to those external opportunities for funds? And can we help our employee groups access those um, other funds? There's also a great deal of advocacy that's going on right now on the part of the Council of Ontario Universities and all of the universities together on encouraging the government to understand the financial challenges that we're facing because we're, we're in, in, ineligible for some of the funds that have been um, provided for businesses, for example, um, be, and, and to help us stabilize uh, some of the employment challenges, the um, enrollment challenges rather, that we're inevitably probably going to face because we are going to have students, domestic students, who may not be able to work, um, find work over the summer and they'd be, be facing financial challenges. Um, we really don't know at this time when international borders are going to start opening up. They might start opening up slowly. There might be by national agreements on international borders. So this is all going to have an impact on our enrollment. And as I've said, we're trying to model out those risks now. Um, but I believe that there's a lot of creative strategies that we can implement around HR uh, in collaboration with our unions to do our best to adhere to those principles um, that is informing all of our decision making. And I'm not sure if um, Sheila wants to add anything or Anyone else? Thank you, uh, Rhonda, for that. I think you covered uh, off quite a bit. I just wanted to add that um, we're also not just thinking about the short term types of solutions like that get us from here to, to June or July, but we're also looking uh, at modeling out longer term because our goal is to keep as many of our key projects going um, as we're in this mode. Um, and move into the future. So the, the principle around that is, you know, uh, as uh, Rhonda said earlier, is making sure we maintain a level of health and wellness for all our faculty and staff, as well as our students uh, going forward, but also to keep the university running. All right, thank you. So. Uh, we have a question in uh, through the email. So just a reminder to everyone who is uh, out there uh, watching who may have joined a bit late, uh, that if you would like to ask a question, you can do so through the conversations at yourq.ca account. That's conversations at yourq. Uh, so one of those questions we received uh, is, uh, will the upcoming university academic plan be reimagined to address the shift to online learning platforms? and the different challenges and opportunities associated with this shift. For example, repurposing vacant land and property on the Kiel campus for various research initiatives that align themselves with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Well, since our provost is the chair of the technical subcommittee of the Senate Academic Policy Planning and Research Committee that has carriage over bringing that UAP to Senate, I will turn this question over to her. Thank you, Rhonda. I'm so delighted to have a question about the university academic plan. And I have to say that that uh, very uh, inspiring work that we've been doing with the whole community had to be set aside for a bit while we um, you know, reoriented ourselves to a new reality, but we are starting to return to it now. I've just been meeting with the um, Senate committee members uh, who are taking the lead on this plan. And we all agreed that it really would be important to try to keep that conversation going. Um, it's been uh, a great process that's involved so many different voices and I think that some excitement has been building about the idea of formulating a challenge to ourselves as York University to really see what we could do to contribute to the sustainable development goals that the United Nations has set out, um, not as a separate thing but as part and parcel of the great work we do in our, uh, in our academic mission and all aspects of our teaching, our research, um, our student supports um, and all the surrounding aspects of running a university. Um, and so uh, that's a great question about whether we want to rethink some aspects of the draft UAP um, based on the experience we're going through right now. It does seem pretty um, likely that all the new skills people are learning and all the new reflections they're having about the strengths and the limitations of online learning um, are going to be a continuing conversation in higher education. 
and that we may well find that we, um, while many uh, activities resume that we are badly missing right now, that we also end up continuing to do some new things with our pedagogy, for instance, um, and with our with our research methodologies. So um, we did think that it, it probably, as, as a Senate committee, we thought it's probably important that we take a close look at whether the language that's already in the draft plan sufficiently captures, um, you know, the, the kinds of innovation that we're all, you know, experiencing as a, as a sort of live experiment right now. Uh, there's certainly already is language in there about the importance of, um, uh, of, of pedagogical innovation and online learning and blended learning and uh, active learning, student-centered learning, experiential learning. But we're gonna have another look to see whether there's some additional content we might want to bring in based on this experience that we're having. As for the lands surrounding the Kiel campus, and, and I might just turn this to Carol in a moment, but we are, you know, in the process of returning to a big discussion that, um, you know, has been going on for a while, has perhaps been on the back burner a little bit the last couple of years, but that we want to uh, reinvigorate, which is around the lands for learning, these uh, lands that surround the academic core of the Kiel campus, and how we could develop those lands in a way that um, really complements our academic mission and the things we want to achieve in the next uh, five years um, as set out in the university academic plan. So I think it's very astute to ask about how could we be developing those lands in ways that enhance our contributions to the sustainable development goals. Carol, was there anything you might wanna add about the Lands for Learning consultation? Sure, just a, a little bit to uh, to give a bit of timeline about that. I think that uh, this fall will be out uh, in the community, uh, whether it's virtually or or physically, um, consulting with the community, the community internal to the university and then external to the university about how those lands might be best used for our future to not only uh, to not only connect. Um, to the uh, to the academic uh, activities, the academic mission of the university, but also to uh, be a community builder, to to knit together um, uh, the community that that of which we are a part, a, a center part, um, but uh, but also the broader community. So that does also call into to question some of those ideas of, of broader outreach and technology, etc. But so it's really um, we look forward to the, to those conversations because we I think uh, unusually at this time. We're ready to uh, launch into uh, conversations and actually developing those lands to enhance both the university's work and uh, and to improve our communities. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so, go to a question we received over email uh, from a student relations coordinator. Has there been any discussion regarding our counseling services and increasing their resources? I perceive that there will be many students who will need these services in the future. Well, I would only say to that, that I think it will be really important to take the guidance of our division of students, thinking both, as well as the Dean ABP graduates, so thinking both about our undergraduate students and our graduate students, and to find out where there are pressures, uh, where there are shortages in terms of either the quantity um, of uh, services that are available, um, or, the, or different kinds of services that might be available and for us to be very responsive to those needs as we go along. I don't know whether or not our provost has something she wants to add. Go ahead, Lisa. I just wanted to say that um, the Division of Students um, uh, Counseling and Accessibility Office is absolutely fully operational and actually interacting with a lot of students. Um, the Faculty of Graduate Studies also fully operational online. Its uh, wellness uh, coordinator is, has been very active in connecting with students. So I urge you, if you um, want to talk to somebody or if you would like to know what resources are available, um, to go and check out the, um, the websites that uh, explain exactly how you can link into those services and contact people and make an appointment. Um, they're working from home, but fully engaged and available. And I think it's a really good idea if you, um, you know, are a bit destabilized by what's going on and uh, feeling stressed about how it impacts your studies or your life, please reach out. Uh, people are very eager to support you. Could I just add a comment here about mental health? And I think that 
As a community, we all share our responsibility to support each other and in particular to support our students. And we know that those that are already suffering from anxiety, from depression, um, to be put into this situation of uh, enormous change, of a great deal of uncertainty, the social isolation can be very um, significant triggers for, uh, for mental health issues. So I would just ask all of us to share responsibility if someone reaches out to us um, that uh, are clearly needing help, that we're all familiar with the services that are available and we can help direct those individuals who might need support. Thank you very much. Uh, we received several questions, uh, which are all uh, similar in the sense of students uh, who are having some difficulty in accessing um, accommodation, uh, whether that be for their coursework, uh, for their finals, uh, other kinds of examinations that the, they might be facing. So uh, if a student feels that they're not getting uh, the accommodation uh, they need um, to, to be successful, uh, how, can, how can students handle that situation? Lisa, do you want to take that? Uh, your first your first point of contact is always your instructor in your course um, if you're having trouble reaching that instructor for some reason or feel that you need to be able to talk to somebody else your program advisor is another really good person to reach out to um, your associate dean's office your dean's office i, I think that you may um, find that there's a fairly heavy um, uh, demand right now for people's time to work through uh, problems and so the first call you make may not be the one who can immediately answer your question. Please keep trying. Um, there are uh, a number of different, uh, you know, resources that can help you and can help connect you with the right person. So I think your program advisor, your associate dean's office, um, the registrar's office has an excellent site that explains what accommodation policies we have that you can access. Uh, we've certainly waived the need for any kind of sick notes for people who are impacted by this situation, who need to um, have a bit more time to complete their work. Um, and so we are really encouraging all programs to be accommodating, to be flexible, to understand this is going to generate a lot of unusual circumstances for people um, and that we do want everyone to be able to complete their programs and their courses. So. Um, I hope that that provides a few additional suggestions about where you could reach out. Could I, could I possibly encourage any students who are on uh, right now that it may well be the case that students did not require accommodation for face-to-face -face classes, but with new online and remote learning strategies actually do require accommodation. And I would just urge those students to reach out to our accommodation office and to apply for or seek any type of accommodation that you feel that you need at this time and to get their help and their support. All right, so we're coming up on time here, but I'm going to abuse my uh, moderator privilege and uh, ask one more question because we have had a few people ask uh, how they can continue to access library resources uh, during this time. Um, and whether that be a graduate student looking at comps or just uh, or an undergraduate student uh, looking to, you know, do something in their coursework. So uh, any advice and guidance there? So I would definitely reach out to um, libraries. I want to emphasize that even though we made the decision that we needed to close um, traffic going in and out of the libraries, obviously a big space where a lot of people could congregate was you know, directly in opposition to recommendations around um, you know, keeping people uh, separate and social isolation. But the operations of the universities, uh, the libraries continue to run the supports. Uh, I'm, I, me I mentioned in my remarks that our Dean of Libraries has been in touch with publishers and with other libraries to increase digital ac access to library resources. Um, so I think that in the first instance, I would recommend that people reach out to the office hours that are available through libraries um, to get particular advice, but I'll, I'll turn it over to the provost. Maybe she has some other recommendations. No, I think that's really where I was gonna go as well. The York University Libraries website 
explains how you can access um, uh, you know, connecting with a reference librarian online or by telephone uh, for individual counseling, all of their e-resources that are available. But also, um, you know, we have a lot of leaders in our libraries uh, in the area of open access and open educational resources. And uh, all of that work is really paying off in big time now because um, they are really able to look at, we, we can't provide hard copy materials. There are safety issues and health issues with even uh, retrieving books and using paper materials right now. But um, there's uh, new initiatives to make available certain materials that in the past have only been available in print. So archival materials, manuscripts, uh, resources that um, haven't been easy to access online are becoming more accessible online. So ex uh, excerpts from, uh, from books um, that you might be looking for, for your course materials, for your research, uh, for your comp preparation, uh, definitely reach out. You might be quite surprised by what they can actually put together in digital form for you and replicate what you would have otherwise been looking uh, to the archives for to the print materials. Um, so I do encourage you to go on the York University Libraries website. Uh, I think you'll find that they're extremely available to help. Did we lose you, Graham? I think that we're um, coming up on time here. And I do just want to close by saying that these are obviously, it goes without saying, unprecedented times right now. And uh, I think that often in facing such uh, a crisis, it might be tempting to focus just on the very short term needs that can seem overwhelming at the time. But what I've been so impressed with by our entire team and frankly, the entire community is the spirit of thinking about how we can work together to address short term priorities, but also frankly, keeping our eye on where we're going to be over the next five years. What are our opportunities? How do we maintain the momentum? that we have been achieving with this university and that frankly we see in our response to COVID-19. So we're very carefully balancing the short-term needs with long-term opportunities. Even some of the difficult times that we're facing, the lessons learned uh, around online remote learning, how to manage meetings, um, how to conduct research in difficult circumstances, I've seen this incredible creativity with people thinking about micro-credentials, um, what program um, revisions might be needed, uh, lifelong learning. And these are all strengths that we're gaining that are gonna not only see us through this pandemic, but they are going to continue to strengthen this university. We've got an excellent uh, emergency operations group, a great deal of expertise. And while difficult for sure, we're undertaking the kind of scenario planning that's necessary with a very um, significant commitment to transparency and working together on how we can continue to move the university forward and advance our students. I just wanna thank each and every one of you again, and I wanna close with a reminder about the importance of social distancing, looking after yourselves and looking after each other. Thank you so much for joining us today.